Ning, Dusinzin, Makwa, Dwayne Perry, Coco Ramapo, Ninun Gie, Ramapo, Munse, Lenape, Nawalatuman, Undach, Ato. We are Chief Perry of the Ramapo Muncie Lenape Nation, and Al, also a member of the Ramapo Muncie Lenape Nation. And what I did was greet you all in the, the Muncie language with uh, who we are. We are you know, members of the Ramapo Muncie Lenape Nation, also our clan, which is Deer Clan, a toe. So it's, it's quite a pleasure to come to you and to be able to speak uh, the Muncie language, the original language of these lands, the original language of our, our uh, ancestors, Muncie ancestors. And like so many indigenous languages worldwide, the Muncie language is, is, uh, is endangered. Uh, the, the last uh, native speakers in, in, uh, in, are in, on, uh, in Canada and I believe have, uh, have passed on, but there are dedicated efforts to, to uh, keep the language alive. And I just wanted to say a special thanks to our language teacher, Karen, for helping to keep the language uh, alive. I mean, it will always be alive in the sense that it is the original language of these lands. And even the name Manhattan is, is, a, is a Muncie word. It has different translations or people think of it as differently. Some people call it land of uh, many hills. A uh, recent translation said is land where we got our arrows from. Uh, but there's no doubt that it's a Muncie word. And what I find interesting about the place that I'm coming to, to you from, which is um, also called uh, New York in New Jersey, we're in the uh, Hudson Highlands, is that this area of the, uh, the world is considered the most linguistically diverse uh, era, uh, area on, in, on the planet. So there's over 800 different languages spoken in the area. But it's only until recently that Muncie has, has returned as, as the language of human beings and, and people, people talking. And it's very important that we, we speak Muncie language, even greetings, uh, like in good morning, a Wulu Wapen, because that keeps the language alive and it keeps us connected to to uh, you know, our ancestors, uh, both both human and and uh, and, and non-human ancestors. So we had a solstice uh, a ceremony on Sunday, and Chief Perry, and he may talk about this later. He talks about how the hoop of the nations in these lands was was first broken here. This is where we had the first contacts with, uh, with colonization. Uh, in our case, uh, the Dutch were the major power that we had uh, interactions with uh, 400 years ago or so. So when Chief Perry says the, the hoop of the nations was broken here and that we had communications with uh, other indigenous people all the way to the uh, Pacific Ocean, you know, my rational mind is thinking, you know, how can that be? And one of the ways that is, is that, that you know, we're all connected. You know, we, we, we're talking about here on World Unity Week, you know, how we're weaving things together. Uh, and I think that's a good, good way to look at it, is that we're, we're, you know, continuing to weave what has been woven before as well, in, in the sense that, uh, you know, we're connected to people not only through space, which is how we're coming to you now, many people throughout the globe, we're also connected through time as well. So I'd say, you know, the ancestors, both vertically we're connected to the ancestors and to our descendants, and then horizontally with each, each one on the earth. So what I find interesting is that with the uh, sunrise ceremony that I was uh, um, honored to uh, have conducted under the the teachings of Chief Perry and, and, and others, whom I'll mention, uh, it's his way of reconnecting. Uh, and so when we stop those ceremonies, or rather when those ceremonies are disrupted, which they were in the colonial era in particular, 
Uh, but even to the modern era, it, uh, even now we're under severe threats to our, our lands and, and our place. Uh, being able to conduct those ceremonies helps bring us back to a, a good place and helps us in terms of surviving and going forward. So when those ceremonies are disrupted or when you have a break, you know, that only, not only affects that not only affects the people here, but it has a ripple effect throughout the continent. So, and you can see that with the, with the waves of colonization, the warfare, the displacement, the dispossession, you know, those waves started on the East Coast and then moved, moved West. So I'm going to, to say one of our, our morning prayers, which was also reflected in the, the ceremony we had on the solstice. Anushik Kishelamokwain, Anushik Kwachi Manadu, Elamiliang, Kokonaki Ki, Walk, Kishok, Walk, Nipahum, Walk, Alangwe Walk, Walk, Pepe Takwik, Anushik, 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 Anushik. And Indigenous prayers, Muncie prayers as well, are, are prayers of thanks. And, and our, one of our allies who unfortunately is in, uh, in, in prison right now on, on, uh, on un, for unjust reasons, but reasons related to defending these lands. He, uh, uh, Harold Moult, he brought up a good point that, that in, the, in the Mohawk prayers, which is also reflected in our prayers, they're, they're prayers of thanks to stated differently than the way we usually look at prayer. It's not, let me, for back, lack of a better word, the Santa Claus prayer. It's not that, you know, may I get this. I mean, not that we all don't have desires that we want to have fulfilled. Even our desires uh, have, have, a, have, have a place. But we build upon a recognition that what we most need in this world, we already have. So the prayer that I said, the sunrise prayer, starts off with the, with the word, our word that would be translated in English as, as thanks, Anushik, Anushik. Anushik, ki shalamokwain, ki shalamokwain. And it's a very sophisticated concept and, and uh, you know, not having grown up directly with the tradition, I'm, I'm amazed at, at uh, really how, how physics, my study of physics, uh, basic study, helps me understand these indigenous prayers. So, ki shalomokwain, ki shalomokwain is, can be translated as, from whose thoughts we arose, or who created us from thought. Thank you, who created us from thought. And so it's kind of a recognition that, uh, you know, our thoughts are, are real. And sometimes I think the mistake we make in the modern industrial world is that the only thing that seems real to us is what's tangible. And what this is a realization of is that you know, our thoughts, desires have a reality as well that we really need to pay attention to. The Latin American scholar uh, Eduardo Gaeno, or rather it was uh, Carlos Fuentes, he uh, had an interesting perspective on, on the present moment, the now. He says that the past is always with us except oftentimes we don't recognize it for what it is, and, and that's memory. So we remember in the present, memories in the present, and, and that's past, that's our connection to past events. It's not like we have past here, and then we have present here, and we have future here. They're all interconnected. The way the future manifests itself is through, mm -hmm. through desire. So we have desires in the present, and we have memories in the present. So Kishelamokwing, when we say thanks, Anushi Kishelamokwing, we are in a, in a way uh, honoring and giving thanks for you know, our, our future based on also what we've had in our past as well. Anushi Kwachi Manadu, Anushi Kwachi Manadu. And that's interesting because in, in other related, related languages like Unami, they say Gichi Manadu or Gichi Manitou. And you can see variations of that through many different Algonquin languages. The 
Muncie dialect, we say Huachi Manidu, Huachi Manidu. And the concept of Manidu is, is very uh, central to the culture, both past and present. And again, this is where physics comes in. I think physics has the best English translation for Manidu, Manidu being oftentimes translated as spirit. And the idea that everything in the world has spirit, the human world, the, the, the four legged the animals, the, the birds, uh, even the, the, the stones, the trees, uh, even the medicine. I have sage here. This has Manidu, this has, has spirit to it. And in physics, they have the concept that energy, that everything in the phenomenal world has energy. And that's the great revelation of uh, Einstein's theories of uh, relativity. You know, E is equal to MC squared. What that is, is the equivalence of energy and matter. That they're not different and distinct and separate from each other. That they're different manifestations of the same underlying reality. And that greater reality being actually energy itself. So matter, whom we all are, is an expression of, of energy, a fundamental expression of energy, matter and energy, the equivalence. Speed of light squared being a, a way to measure, um, I guess, the equation. That's a measuring device in the equation. And I give thanks, too, to the Lakota people, the, the, the Dakota, Nakota, and Lakota people um, for bringing in the concept of the great mystery. I think it was Russell Means and again, it's interesting how you, you'll see a person that's known as a political activist, say, uh, and, and you begin to see glimpses of how the, you know, the deeper spiritual understanding and traditions where they come from are reflected in the work that they do. So Russell Means would say that uh, you know, the, the, the better term or the better approach is to talk about the great mysterious or the great mystery. And I think that's also a, a, an excellent way to look at uh, at uh, Kishel Mokwing or Huachi Manadu is, is a recognition that a lot of what we consider to be reality is beyond thought, beyond our comprehension. I mean, it's, it's somewhat a bit of an arrogance to think that we can consciously comprehend the incomprehensible. Elamiliang, Elamiliang, forgiving to us. So even before we ask for anything, forgiving to us. Elamiliang, Kukana Aki. Aki, which is um, Mother Earth, Aki, Earth, Aki, Mother Earth. And it's interesting that that concept is so powerful. It seems they've even penetrated our, our modern industrial minds in the, in the English speaking world. It seems like we've lost such a connection to the, uh, the sacred uh, that I give thanks for that word, Mother Earth, because that's a direct translation. And it's, uh, something that can be understood by, by uh, people even in our modern industrial world. And sometimes I think it's not so much that we've evolved, but we've devolved and need to re-evolve. Uh, Anushik Kishok, Anushik Kishok, thank you, son. And in the ceremony that we had for the Alliance, Roger Jock, the, uh, the elder and, and uh, traditional longhouse representative from uh, Akwesasne, uh, I like the way he referred to uh, the elder brother as uh, the son as the elder brother. You know, I'm not sure if I'm quite there yet. I, th I think I like uh, a more uh, parental father, perhaps, is uh, the word that often comes up. But the elder brother, it's, it's a relation, relationship. I mean, where would, we be, where would we be without the son? We wouldn't be without the son. I mean, there, there's, there's no way to, for us to imagine us as we are now without our relationship to the, to the son, Kishok. Anushik Nipahum, Nipahum, the, uh, the moon. And actually, interesting fact about the moon that uh, many uh, geologists, my mentor, Dr. Jackson, brought up is that there's um, speculations in the scientific world that the moon actually was formed from the sun, that you had in the, in the primordial era of the universe, uh, another planet that actually came and hit the sun or interacted with the sun and that the moon actually is part of the earth that became the moon. I just find that uh, 
be a fascinating story there. I don't know if it's true or not. I, I haven't studied that much uh, geology. But um, you know, since we have a, a, a free-flowing format here, uh, just even, even globally, worldwide, uh, the Hopi people have, have uh, had, a, had a warning that's kind of intrigued me to this day. They, they asked, or they, they told the, or recommended to the, the NASA astronauts not to bring back any rocks from the moon. But of course, that's exactly what, um, what the uh, astronauts did when they went to the moon. And I've always been intrigued by that, that uh, warning. And what can you say? I mean, we, we are living in the atomic age and the same technology that you know, takes us to the moon is the same kind of technology that leads to, uh, to nuclear war. And that's one of the fundamental questions we have is how do we balance our inquisitiveness, our curiosity with uh, our need to be mindful of, of what we already know which is that unless we have the good things of this planet, then we're not going to survive. So to the extent that going into space exploration results in the destruction of what we have, we need to be mindful that you know, perhaps there's other ways to, to get to that kind of um, uh, knowledge. Anushik uh, Along Waywalk. Anushik Along Waywalk. Thank you, stars. And of course, the sun is uh, one star of many, many stars. And again, I've heard the uh, physicists say, the astrophysicists say, if you were to collect all the grains of sand over all the world and count them, they would be less than all the stars in our multiverse, our universe. So that's somewhat humbling to think that, you know, our star, as powerful as it is, is, is one of, uh, has many relations throughout the uh, universe. What I find interesting as well is that the, uh, and it ties into the solstice is, they say the universe is not only expanding, but it's accelerating its expansion. It kind of reminds me of that drum beat, you know, you had the beat, you know, so you had the sound and you had the, the space there. So on the solstice, it was interesting when we talk about directions, in some ways that's related to the sun, one of the stars and some of the, uh, features we find in our sacred lands are also related to the Pleiades and star formations. So where we had our solstice ceremony is intimately connected to the, to the cosmos. The physicists say that uh, everything moves, every, all matter, all energy is in movement. From the smallest subatomic particle to the largest galaxy is always in movement. Interesting question arises as to you know, why do we go clockwise or counterclockwise in ceremony. And that really depends on orientation. Uh, Floyd Littleson, one of our elders said that uh, we Muncie, Ramaphone Muncie people, we follow the, uh, uh, the sun. The sun rises in the east and sets in the west according to how we visualize it. So we follow the path of the sun when we go clockwise. The, Haudenosaunee, they go counterclockwise. And he said that's because they follow the earth. Because when you think about it, the earth is actually rotating uh, west to east. That's why the sun appears in the east because the earth is rotating that way. So it appears, although the sun appears to be going this way, really what's happening is the earth is rotating this way. That's why the sun appears to rise in the east and set in the west. But what it all comes down to, whether it's counterclockwise or clockwise, it's not right or wrong. It's about tradition and it's about being aware of how we move in, in, in the world itself and how we perceive the world. Um, Anashik Pepe Takwit, thank you, lightning. And that's one I'm still trying to, to understand. Uh, we had some, some uh, wonderful lightning uh, uh, effects or lightning came to visit us last night in these lands and, and it's, uh, it's it's interesting how something so powerful uh, only lasts a, a, a moment a moment in time and I was counting the the uh, the space between the lightning and the thunder and I think it was about 13 seconds I'm not sure how many miles it is like 10, 10 miles or so but you know you had that brief flash at night and it's just a reminder how, how powerful the, uh, the, the lightning is so uh, 
Yeah, that was part of the the basis for the um, you know the sunrise uh, ceremony, and and again, it helps me. The language, the prayer has helped me uh, keep my own sanity. I mean, uh, when we had part of the ceremony near the the, the stones on the plateau there, uh, I was reminded of a, a tragedy that occurred to a community that I was in in uh, 2007. Uh, April 16th, that, 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 that date is seared in my memory because that's the day they had, uh, there was a, a massacre of 33 people in, um, at Virginia Tech where I was teaching at the time, 33. You know, and no one really, none, none of us imagined that was going to happen where we were. I mean, of course that's the reality in modern day United States. We don't know when someone's going to, to blow up. And it happened there at that time then. And actually I happened to be in Washington, DC. I mean, it was one of the few times during that period of time I had been out of town. I just happened to be out of town that time. And I was trying to make sense of it and I, and I, I couldn't, you know, I mean, none of the people there deserve what had happened to them. But what I took away from all of this was, was to be thankful for the day, to be thankful for, for every day and not to take the day for granted. I try to remind myself of that, you know, we, we can't take these days for granted. We can't take ourselves for granted. And uh, I'll just go ahead and hand it over to, to uh, Chief Chief Dwayne Dwayne Perry. But that's how we started off in the morning uh, on this solstice was uh, was greeting our elder brother, the son, and and giving thanks. So Anishik, um, and Unity Earth, and and I'll, I'll hand it over to, to Chief Perry. Chief Dwayne, your volume has gone very quiet. Oh, okay. Thank you. We try and fix it. Okay. Um, so we missed the volume here for nothing at all. Oh, I see. How's that? Is that better? No, it's actually not. Um, it's like... Um, it's very different than, than before. Okay, this is uh, fully up. I wonder. Hmm. If you try and um, um, mute yourself for a second and unmute and see. Okay, that's, that sounds the same. Want to make sure everybody can hear you. Oh, so is that better? It's not. Um, Interesting. Hmm. I, I can move the camera the other way. That it was before. It was, uh, you know facing uh, in this direction, it was louder. I don't know why I would do that. I uh, haven't done anything. Um, thank you everybody for standing by for a moment. If if you can, um, if, you know, you're muted, let's see again, try to speak again. Okay, hello. That's a little better. Do you know, um, can, we go, can we go into your settings for a second? And I'll help you with this. So if you go to the right of the word mute, it's a little arrow and you click there. You go to audio settings. Thank you for everybody for standing by. And you'll see microphone. Can you make sure that's turned up? Okay, so sounds and vibrations. Do you see where the microphone, where it says um, microphone and volume? And there's a little bar that you can move up and down. Oh, yeah, I got the media notification. Well, maybe, maybe he has it on uh, automatically adjust my microphone volume because I know on mine it is. So you might have to unclick that. Yeah, try unclicking that and let's see if it gives us a different sound. Okay, it says system sounds. That's what I want to click. Yeah, where it says audio settings, you're in audio. System sounds, vibration control, quality and effect. No, equalizer, Dolby. That's not it. I'm not um, do you see where it's, what, what do you see at the top of your screen? Do you see speaker and microphone? No. Okay, so we'll start again. So where the microphone is, is a little arrow to the right of it. You click the little arrow up and you choose audio settings at the bottom. Let's go back, I'm in sounds. This is as a... Uh, Sound. Are you actually in the Zoom? Are you in the Zoom settings though? No. 
we need you to be come back to the zoom window for a second and let's do it within zoom because i think it's something to do with zoom okay no problem all righty okay so you're back in the zoom window there's the microphone where it says mute it's a little arrow up click on that arrow and go to audio settings it's like at the bottom okay so Do you see it? Microphone is either mute or not mute. Okay. Do you see, well, do you see there's a little arrow to the right of the microphone? No. Okay. Um, do you see start video and mic mute and start video? Yes, yeah, start video. And there's not a tiny little arrow in between the, the microphone and the start video? No. Okay. If you go up to... Are you, you on, go, are you on your are you on your phone or are you on the computer? I'm on the phone. Maybe um maybe you get on the computer. Are you, getting, are you able to you get on the computer sometimes too, right? Yeah, I do. I was trying to get that earlier, but it wasn't really working that well. So. How about, do you have earphones with a microphone that you could plug in and then you could hold the microphone closer to you? Of course not. Is it better if I maybe just speak loud? That's, you bit? sound better right now. It sounds better right now. I mean, it's not as, as, as good as it was before, but we just want to make sure we hear you and I appreciate everybody's just patience while we're... Better if I put it right here. Can you hear me now? Yeah, yeah that's just, better. <laughs> just pretend that me or another Ramapo messed up sometime in the past like you have before and just, just get, get your chief voice on. <laughs> well, when I'm in this, uh, not the, uh, when I'm in this format where it's up and down rather than the uh, sort of the larger portrait, you can hear me better, right? No, not really. It's, it's, it's about the same. So, but if, so, uh, um, unless so Ian... Ian, do you have any um, any ideas? He's on a phone. Do you have any ideas, Ian? Are you there? Says connect Bluetooth Wi-Fi. That's not it. Well, that's a problem. Not quickly, but we could sound check him in another room if you'd yeah. like to carry on. Okay. Um, let's just we we could how how uh, how bad would it be for us to proceed with the audio there? I mean. Um, You're muted, Ian. I, I can't hear him at all. Okay. All right. Sure. So um, where can can we put the link? Wait, Chief Perry, we're going to put the link in the chat for you. Because, yeah, I was muted because you couldn't hear me. So what were you saying? Um, so um, we're going to give you a link for you to pop out of this room and to do a sound check in another room and then come back. Well, if you guys could send me the, the link and just send it by email and I'll bring it up on, on the uh, desktop. Okay. Brother Al, can you put Chief Dwayne's email in the chat for a technical producer? Sure, sure. Okay, and then we'll come back to... So I can uh, just click it on. Yes. Yep, you'll be able to click from that and then you'll go with Ian and then Ian will send you back here. <laughs> we'll get this, well, we'll get this ready. Volume, I definitely have a volume uh, adjustment on the uh, laptop, on the table, on the you know, desktop, so I can turn it up. Yes, thank you. We'll see you in a few minutes. You're gonna get an email and uh, we'll see you back in a few minutes. So we'll come back to Brother Al. All right. Okay, so, all right, I'm, I'm just sent the email to the technical producer and then send it to you. Thank you. Uh, yeah, we can, uh, I, I, I guess I'll just jump into a discussion on the, uh, the great law of peace. Thank uh, you, Brother Al. Yes, so the second part of our program, which was really uh, orchestrated by, by Chief Dwayne Perry was a commemoration of our renewal of our alliance with the, uh, the, the Mohawk Nation. And, their land, and it's, it's important uh, uh, to bring up the fact that Mohawk is not their name for themselves. In their language, they are called the Ghanaian Gahaga, Ghanaian Gahaga people. People of the, the Flint is one of the translations I've heard, and, and there's others. And we really owe the Haudenosaunee people, the people of the Longhouse, the 
the, the Mohawk in English, uh, the Seneca, the Gayuga, the Oneida and the Onondaga, you know, the original five nations, uh, a, a great debt because of the contributions that were made to the uh, structure of governance uh, we, we have now, which for all of its faults, contains elements of the great path of peace that we can use to build upon so that we can survive into the future in a, in a good way. But important elements were left out of that, that uh, those teachings that the founders of the Republic, the, you know, the modern, or rather the you know, United States Republic uh, got. And, you know, I'm not going to debate as to how the you know, U.S. Constitution came about. I mean, I guess there's enough blame and, and praise to go around for everyone. I think I like uh, uh, John F. Kennedy Jr.'s statement that success has many uh, uh, fathers or parents, whereas uh, failure appears to be an orphan. So I, I look at the, the Republic, the U.S. Republic, um, as, as like a river. A river can have many different points of origin not just one. You can't just go to one place and say that this is the origin of the river and the only one. Uh, what we can say is that this is a place of origin for the river. So the Haudenosaunee Confederacy, the great law of peace, which Dr Roger Jock translates as the great path of peace is one of those points of, uh, of origin. Um, but yeah, one of the instructions, part of the instructions that were left out was the role of women. I mean, women have a prominent place in the you know, political life of the of the Confederacy and the different nations therein. But it's important to keep in mind that in the modern U.S. Republic, you know, women were not even allowed to vote until 1920. So that's something that we need to think about in, in this in, in these lands here, in this American system we have, these United States of America, is how can we have a democracy when more than half of the people are left out of that uh, political system where they're rendered as non-people? And that's something that's continuing to today. I mean, we have uh, apartheid today, which uh, I'll, I'll, I'll talk about in a moment. Do we, have, uh, do we have Chief Perry back on? Not yet. Okay. Uh, also, the, the, the role of uh, uh, people of African descent here, that's also oftentimes overlooked. I mean, it's, it's a reflection of the split we have even today because we're so much focused up here and on the, you know, on the written word, what we have, have in the books. We often forget that the wealth of the nation was based upon the blacks of the backs of black people, of, of people of African descent. I mean, I remember growing up and going to the university and, and reading, I think his name was Max Weber, what considered to be one of the founders of sociology and the whole concept of the uh, Protestant work ethic, Protestant work ethic, and the idea that the country was built by, you know, white Anglo-Saxon Protestants and, you know, how thrifty they were and, and how that kind of ethos came about and led to the generation of wealth that is the envy of the world, that kind of thing. And, that's not to say that people didn't work hard and didn't read their Bibles and, and didn't make sacrifices to bring what we call wealth to the world today, which again, what we were mentioning earlier is, is sometimes we forget that our true wealth we already have without even asking for it. You know, the, the waters, the earth, the winds, the fire. That's beside the point. There is a lot of uh, uh, artificial uh, wealth that's been generated. But then uh, what's left out is, is, is uh, the, the, the slave work ethic, let's call it that. I mean, let's not forget that a lot of the wealth of the nation was built on the backs of people that were enslaved, that were abused, and did not benefit from the labors that they had, or, or let's say it was misappropriated. And just recently, I, I think I saw it on the, on the um, show Democracy Now! from a Amy Goodman. There was a professor whose name escapes me who brought up the fact that, interestingly enough, during the Civil War, 
the mayor of New York City wanted New York City to secede as well. Why? Not because he hated Black people. It's because the wealth in New York City was intimately tied to the slave trade. I mean, I think the, other than land in the South, the most valuable resource in the South were other people, were the enslaved peoples. That was the most valuable resource in the South, the second most valuable, were the people themselves. And that's also um, is, is something for us to, to ponder is, is the fact that the enslavement of other people was a, was, was a, it is and was a major part of the wealth of the nation. And I think that's something that we grapple with now. I mean, do we have to live in a world where our, how we measure wealth is based on misappropriation of, of labor from other people, be it not paying them enough wages, not paying for health care, putting people in, in uh, neighborhoods that are, are polluted? Do we live in a, a system of, of scarcity? Or do we live in a world of abundance where what we have, we have in abundance if we, if we only open our eyes and, and, and recognize? What uh, Gandhi uh, brought up, I, and it's interesting that, that Gandhi had a, a statement on the Hindu scriptures, the Bhagavad Gita, that I think is very relevant to, to uh, us in these lands here. And, what he said was he, he gave um, honor to the uh, Isha Upanishad. And the first phrase of the Isha Upanishad, which is from fullness, fullness comes, yet fullness remains. And there's a particular uh, translator, Eknath Eswaran, uh, who translated that in English and the commentary was quite, uh, quite insightful. And what Eknath Eswaran said was that that phrase really is revolutionary. And how Gandhi honored that phrase, he says, he said that if you burn down all the scriptures in the Hindu canon, and of course it's quite extensive. And even in the Upanishads, if you were to burn down all the Upanishads and the only phrase left was that phrase, the Isha Upanishad, that Hinduism would survive. And again, that's the realization that we live in a world of abundance, not scarcity, but we live in an economic system in which we're trying to create a world of scarcity be it water, be it attention from other people. So in many ways, we here in the East as indigenous people are, are in that, that situation of almost everything have been being destroyed. But what we, do, what we do have here in the Ramapo Mountains is we have our, our land that our ancient ancestors lived on. And we are, we're their descendants. And the land itself is a, is a book. The land itself is scripture. So that's one of the reasons why we, we take a stand in, in uh, support of the water and support of the, uh, you know, the air and the land itself. And because that's what it means for us to be Ramapo and what it means for us to be Muncie. So I, I see Chief Perry's back on and hopefully we have some, uh, some sound now. Okay, I guess that means it's me. Okay. I'm on Greetings, everyone. I'm Chief Perry of the Ramapo Lenape, the Muncie people of the uh, New York, New Jersey border region as it stands now. I apologize for the technical difficulties and how I missed quite a bit of what you were speaking about. Um, what I would like to do is like to, we had a most astonishing event, actually a number of events yesterday, and I would like to not just recap them, but I think they were far more, uh, the importance of them carried itself beyond the moment. Initially, I'd like to speak about the solstice. It, it's on our, at the top of our mountain on the Tahita Way the gate that opens. And the interesting thing that we found about our portal was as children, I always used to remember the elders would go up there, primarily the women, because it was considered a spot of, of power, a spot of, of cleanliness, a part of energy. 
And I can assure you, and if there's a, of the other natives on here, well, no, you do not ask elder women why they are going into the mountains for ceremony. That would be tantamount to an eternal spanking. So as it may be, one of the things that has been arisen recently is we found out, and I think this is extremely, uh, not telling, but extremely profound. I believe Al may have, may have touched upon it. The very first thing the people that came to North America did, first of all, you need to understand that most all of these portals in the world, I think there may be something in the neighborhood of maybe 30,000 globally. But the very first thing these folks did when they arrived in North America was to close the portal, not to meet the natives, not to, not to settle, not to establish New York, not to become pilgrims, was to meet, was to close the portal, to extinguish the connection between the sacred and the people, to eliminate the sacred, the strength of the people from the earth. That's extremely profound. I don't want to sound like a Harry Potter fan. But are these people the same, uh, even the same species? Think about it. If we take it a step further and you think, well, the next thing was we're celebrating discovering America. Of course, it was in uh, Costa Rica with the uh, Arawaks. But why the majority of the world was basically warning each other, don't get in the boat, watch out, tie on a rope, you're going to fall off the edge, you're going to go to outer space, watch out, be safe. Some small handful of our relatives was going, when we get the gold out of North America, let's shoot to uh, Peru, get the emeralds, back around, grab the diamonds, and go forward. Meanwhile, myself and others, if, if indeed I was from there, are yelling, please tie the rope on, don't get on the boat. At the very least, some one of these folks had extraordinary knowledge of the globe and the world. And they've used that, that closing of the Tahita way, that closing of the portal to subjugate the, the, the natural people of the world, the indigenous people of the world. That's profound. That goes beyond uh, Columbus sailed the ocean blue and George Washington. And to give a scale of survival as there are so many marginalized tribal people globally and from the from the american standpoint it sounds so very exotic and it certainly is if you're in the congo or the uh, you know they're in the amazon and around you're in you know various different uh, countries where they have they have destroyed the, the tribal people uh, i just want to bring a little context to what's happening there and what's happening here in new york the major difference between the Ramapo Lenape Muncie people here in metropolitan New York and the rest of the tribal people in the world and is in no way to belittle it is we are in metropolitan New York. Right now at this moment, there is much a land grab, a much of a subjugation of people, a much of a suppression of religion, a much of a, 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 as can possibly be as initially what drives that. It's simply, we are in metropolitan New York. I was by the Tahita way not, not a year ago with some folks that uh, had like money, like one of the people that had been president for a minute. And they didn't see the beauty in the land. They talked about how wonderful it would be to put a house here, how what a power spot overlooking Manhattan. So what I'm getting at is the survivability of the Ramapos have really come in a far different stage than most people in the world, but I think it is a good example that if, unless we join together collectively, unless we go beyond our normal understanding of where we're from in the world, if, if, if we go beyond what spiritual path we find, if we do not reinvest ourselves, and I'm talking to each and every one of us, if we do not look deeper into ourselves to build our culture in a more, a more serious way. We are all indigenous to some part of this turtle island. We are all children of the earth. When we can internalize the fact that we are all indigenous, that we are one, that we need each other to survive, we will be lifting up all of us as we stand. As long as I'm gonna be from 
space mobile and the other one is from i don't have a dollar we're, we're going to be in the state we're in right now and the state we are in is the earth is in, is in, is crying and, and let us all remember the earth don't need us we need the earth when the earth gets to a certain point it's simply going to throw us up and go keep on going so i would like to ask everyone as we go forward number one just as a daily practice that all of us can look at if we look at kindness as an actualization of a prayer let all of us just try to be kind at least kind at least one time during the day as we go forward until it becomes normal or let's acknowledge someone else's kindness as they give it to us so as that prayer and that unity is growing let us really sit down and ponder the fact that we are all truly indigenous the only separation that we have had since the beginning of time is the separation through syntax. The brilliance of someone realizing the psychological affect of syntax. And we've bought into it. One of my most favorites lately has been Antifa. Is there anyone in the Western world at all that, has, that whose family is, hasn't been anti-fascist? <laughs> Brilliant. Brilliant. It's a, a twisting of syntax. So where I'm going with this is, is to say that we are all related. It is important. And what we are doing and, and, and what had happened at the Tahiti Way, our, our portal uh, on the 20th with, with our relative Al and so many wonderful people that came, uh, was to begin to enlighten that moment. As the entire mountain is returned to us, hopefully before the end of the year, we're going to be looking forward to a global gathering of people that understand what a portal is, not myself. I am not the person that has the deeper understanding of those affects, but we will gather together and, 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 and form to not only open it, but to begin to heal all of the nations of, 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 on this turtle island. They did the same thing in Africa and South America and, and the North. They've done it in Russia. And because we were modernized and everyday thinking, even if you go back, uh, we've been given our trains of thought. Who would have thought? Who would have thought that the basis of destroying the earth was the first to destroy the spirituality of the people upon the earth? So now that that's no longer a secret, I would just like, to, as I said, to share with people to go forward with that. So I think a really super thing that had happened uh, on the 20th on Sunday was the beginning of opening that up in the joining of the lake of the light globally that we can all now walk together in strength. As World Unity Week has pointed out and, and Unity Earth has pointed out, as we stand together in peace and understanding and in clarity of knowledge, there are no there are no challenges that cannot be met. Another wonderful thing that appeared to be healing, and I know Brother Al spoke about it, was our renewal of our alliance. And forgive me, it's with the word Mohawk, but with our relatives, went beyond sim a simple alliance. At one time, the history prior to the American Revolution, if the Ramapo had not separated from the Alliance, there would not now be a United States of America. I think that's a big mouthful. But if you understand the fact that the, that the Ramapo allowed what was then our redoubt, the Ramapo Pass to be used by what was then the rebels, George Washington, uh, what that, uh, that in itself, the very act of allowing the rebels to use the Ramapo Pass, essentially, the rebels turned out to be 5,000 French troops. It eliminated any strategic advantage and or surprise to the, to the, uh, to the British. Well, how was that? Because we are the back door to the New England colonies. The only way that they could uh, reinforce the colonies with any sizable number of troops and or supplies was off the Atlantic. That became impossible or to march them down through Canada. So without using the Ramapo Pass, there was really no way to supply and to support uh, the British onslaught in the New England colonies. 
So I think it would become very clear, particularly if you're a, a, a revolutionary war scholar, you would understand that it was that one simple choke choke point in the Ramapo Mountains through the regress of the Ramapo people that allowed George Washington the rebel to essentially establish the nay essence of what we are now calling the United States of America. I think it's also important to understand that the first 900 cannonballs fired in the American Revolution was made from Ramapo Lenape iron deposits. The fabled chain across the Hudson was made from Ramapo Lenape Muncie iron deposits. The Capitol Dome and the Lady of Freedom atop the dome were made from Ramapo Lenape Muncie iron deposits. Our thanks. And it showed the importance of the alliance and the difference in how indigenous people think and how people think they take. That the very first thing that happened once the revolution was settled uh, and, and America became an established country and people were celebrating the 4th of July, the very first people that were enslaved in the United States of America was the Ramapo, Lenape, Muncie people. From that day forth, we have been written out of the, the, the American paradigm. We have been set up on to steal our land. We have been given a false culture, a false background. We have been set up on uh, for, uh, to this moment with a complete onslaught of psychological affects that in many cases have even destroyed a number of our own people. But the beautiful thing about the Alliance was, and I want to add this, this is what the Europeans did. This is what the British did. This is not what the, what the Mohawks did. We were in alliance with the Mohawks at one time. And did we have a conflict with the Mohawks? Yes, but they were relatives. Like now, they're brothers. They were human beings. They were indigenous. These were people that had hearts. These were not people that looked at human beings as commodities, that looked at the woods and the water and the streams as commodities. We simply separated on a political base. We thought that the rebels meant they wanted freedom. We knew that the Dutch were people that, that captivated. So you might even say, even though we're on different sides of, of what was uh, considered a, a colonial war, we were not in, in bred uh, soulfully, dangerously enemies that would never be able to breathe a, a sip of humanity. After the war, the British enslaved us. Think about that. And the wonderful thing that the British did I think this is really telling. This didn't even happen in Germany after World War II. And I think the people uh, there, you know, they turned their salt mines where they hid a lot of the treasure, the German treasures into an international spaces. International spaces. What Americans did, and they're doing it right this moment. They turned the mines that gave us the cannonballs, the chain across the Hudson, the dome, the Capitol Dome, the Lady of Freedom above the dome. They turn those mines into toxic pits. Toxic pits. That at this moment has murdered approximately 30% of my people in the Turtle Clan. This is part of the thanks that we have given, been given for helping to assist the establishment of America. So to say that it was simply an alliance, this, the alliance that we had renewed with our relatives in the North goes far beyond that moment. It goes into tomorrow. It goes into the spiritual affect of this Turtle Island. And for that, we are more than grateful that they have reached out to us. And we have been able to stand firm and to reach back and to enjoy each other's understanding, love, and to begin once again to share our the great law 
and to be able to share the understanding of the spirituality that had brought us to this time and to this place. So it was far more than just a renewal of an alliance. It wasn't a signing of a paper. It was a twining of a spiritual understanding. And for that, I'm eternally grateful to our relatives and to all those who couldn't travel so far to join to be with us. And to the Ramapos that also stood with us in a good way, in a beauty way like that. Another thing that had happened on that day was we opened up the, 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 the uh, Embassy Museum. We began, we, began, we began with a photo uh, exhibit of the Ramapo people. The, the museum wants to, is going to go forward by highlighting the art and the beauty of, of marginalized people, tribes around the world, globally. So although the Ramapo, I would like to, I unfortunately would have to say that we may be the most tech, technologically challenged, as you can see, just getting on Zoom. But I mean, in terms of where we're existing, uh, we believe there are things that we can do as we begin to join ourselves in unity and, and work together with clarity that we will be able to help also our relatives uh, going forward. The museum is going to be able to, and I would put the call out now to all of our, our all of our indigenous relatives globally. If you have some art that you would like to exhibit and work with and, and expand, uh, please contact us. Uh, and we will be glad to work with you and try to get that, try to get your voices heard. Also, I said embassy. We've established what we're calling the first embassy of indigenous people in the Western Hemisphere. What we mean globally. Now, what does that mean? That means that we have acknowledged the fact that although there are, and I want to, I don't, there are diplomatic processes that has helped beyond understanding people throughout the world. A lot of them come here to New York to be a part of that process. The first embassy is struggling now to learn to be a part of the process, the UN process. It cannot be understated how, how very fabulous and how much help they have done globally. But I think what we're looking at in the first embassy is one of our assets that most people don't have indigenous or not and I keep like keep in mind as I said we're all indigenous but we need to understand the essence of that and internalize that so we can walk together this ain't a new age let's all be Indians for a week and a half let's get high and go to a meeting this is about when you understand who you are and internalize your own spirituality to where you've come from you will understand it will enhance what you see yourself as culturally it will enhance what you see yourself as spiritually. So what we're saying here is that what we're prepared to do at the first embassy as we go forward and, and gather with our with our with our with our people is that because of the access that Manhattan allows us, and because we're not going to be bound by the strictures of really polite and dignified diplomacy. If you're destroying the rainforest because you're making money and setting in Manhattan and laughing about it while people are being destroyed, well, we intend to make an appointment, go down. I listen, I have a three piece suit, go down, we'll have a polite discussion. It's not their side or our side, it's going to be all of our sides. And I think we'll be able to sit down and dialogue with the people of power, the people that are making money, the people that are doing the destruction in a more constructive way. If that is not successful, first of all, that's an affect that almost no one in the world can do except somebody from New York or London or some of these other power centers in the world. So we're ready to advocate in, in a real, in a real sort of a more real time way. So we're not talking government to government. We're talking human beings to human beings and let's get it done. Another area that I think that you'll be able to see as effective in terms of diplomacy 
and it's something it's it's a marvelous tool that unity earth has actually been highlighting quite some time i'm i'm, I'm so sorry i was so slow to get to the movie but one of the tools that we can use in a real good way with an open heart in a wonderful way against the most awesome challenges the world may present is the truth it was once said the truth will set you free I believe when you really tell the truth, let's unvarnish, not picking on, not uh, but you highlight exactly what's going on and to allow that spotlight to burn, it will immediately ameliorate a tremendous amount of, of problems going on globally. And I think we'll also be able to connect the dots to realize that a lot of the issues environmentally are coming out of the same group. It's not just the pipelines in uh, New York or in pipelines in uh, America. So at any rate, I would just like to thank our relatives, the Mohawks, and I'd like Al to thank them in their language. I'd like to say it, but I don't want to uh, butcher it here globally. Brother Al is actually walking around and showing us. Yes. You can describe what it is. Yeah. Or, or Brother Al, go ahead. Fago, that's the, um, the fake Fago. I think that's the the, the Mohawk Greetings. Right. Right. So this is a, obviously this is a portrait of myself with uh, four of our women as you can see I'm, I'm uh, uh, more than proud to have a moment to be able to sit among them these are really wonderful women they're powerful women they're strong women they share a lot of a lot of knowledge and confidence and love with the people and they keep us uh, together and, and fortunate to have, like I said, a portrait of them that we can share with the world. Um, okay, some other portraits. This is Wandering Woman. Are we going to go through the, the, the exhibit, L, and then, uh, so like I was saying, I, th I think that as we go forward with the, with the embassy, and as we start to understand ourselves in terms of the truth, in terms of a more poignant understanding of where we are, we will truly be able to resolve a number of global problems once they are looked at in their true context with their unvarnished syntax, we will be able to wash away the foolishness and get to the reality of lifting up uh, the people that need the help. And that is the essence of the First Embassy. Chief Jane, Dwayne, we have a question from our Zoom room in the room one here. Um, Nancy would like to know if there are Indian artifacts in the museum. Uh, at the at the moment, I think within the next maybe before the month is out, I'd say yes. At the moment, no. There's some there's some minor artifacts, but we do have some extremely rare artifacts that will be kept. We're looking at a security system at the moment. So really, thank you for asking that. And uh, we've actually had some considered, uh, yeah, we don't want to put anything in there that, that we cannot secure us completely. So right now we're just looking at security systems. So the short answer is no, but we are more than hopeful. Any other questions that may be to help? I don't know why I look so angry. I, I was trying to look, you know. I think you were angry with me for something, Chief. I can't remember what it was, though. Holy mackerel. Looks amazing. And where exactly is the museum, Chief Dwayne? Oh, yes. It's located at 125. West Main Street in Stony Point, New York. I've put in the chat for our um, for our room guests the yeah. website address, and would just like to share so that everybody can check out the amazing website. It's www.ramapomuncie.org, and I'm going to spell that because it's a different um, yes. spelling. And I wanted to ask you about that actually, um, <laughs> as the different spellings, but I'm going to spell it out for everybody. So we, we can get you to check it out. It's R A M A P O 
M U N S E E dot org. Ramapo dot org. You can check that out. Chief Dwayne? Yeah. The R A M, the M uh, P O U G H spelling. Uh, that's the Dutch spelling. That's the spelling. Uh, you, you all might enjoy this. Uh, that's the spelling that was forced upon us when we were enslaved. That was if you wanted to call yourself the right Ramapo and stay alive, that's how you would spell it. That's exactly the R-A-M-A-P-O is the traditional spelling of Ramapo. Today, we use both of them, one, uh, one sort of in ceremony and the other one are in thought. We tend to use the, uh, the Dutch spelling a lot because over time, we are in New York and we do a lot of business and a lot of our business has initially trans transpired in that language. So it's a lot easier for us to just sort of to co op the language uh, and, and use it rather than uh, be sort of become huffy about the spelling. We know what it is. We use it. We've co opted it. We're using it for the better. But the original difference simply was that you either spell it the way we told you or you don't spell it at all. It's also interesting if you look at the local schools, the local police departments, the local townships, they're spelled with the original Ramapo Lenape spelling, R-A-M-A-P-O. So the people of authority are, <laughs> are using tribal spelling. That's kind of good because I think the, 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 the script is sort of flipping. But the subjugated spelling, the one that we use, is, is, is their actual spelling of, of, yes, of those names. Chief Dwayne, there's another question in the chat. Got great questions from Nancy coming. Um, she wants to know if there's any excavation going on anywhere in New Jersey or New York to seek uh, artifacts. Oh. And what do Ramapo and Mohawk Lenape actually mean? Okay. Ramapo means sweet water. I, I don't want to infer I know what Mohawk means. To me, it means beautifully strong people. So if there's some Mohawk listening, please, please ring, you know, weigh in. I, I, I don't feel secure enough to speak on behalf of our relatives because it, it means so many things in so many ways. Well, if, if I may... Uh, means sweet water. If I may, uh, may offer some words as well. The Almost invariably, the names of the indigenous people, the names we have for ourselves is literally the people. Oh, so, yeah. That's right. yeah, when you look at Cherokee, Navajo, uh, Iroquois, uh, others, uh, invariably the people is the, the, the root word, like the Haudenosaunee or the, the people of the longhouse. Lenny Lenape would be like the true true people. The Ramapo, you know, we're the, we're the people of the, uh, the Sweetwater. Ghani and Gahaga, the people of the Flint. So, interestingly enough, invariably, what you'll find with the different names is some it's reference to the people in one way, shape, or, or form. Uh, the Muncie uh, people, Mun Muncie, Minnesink, um, I believe it might be uh, related to uh, some people say the, the, the wolf clan or the wolf people of, of, uh, of these lands. Uh, and as, as far as uh, burial grounds, what have you, and this is interesting how you know, we, we always try to, to disconnect ourselves from each other and, and other people. One of our members, Chris Moore, uh, was instrumental in the uh, re, uh, recovery and uncovering of the African, what's called the African burial grounds in lower Manhattan. And his mother, who was uh, also Rambo, uh, I think was the one that actually instructed him to, to go investigate. And the first thing that he heard from the from management there at the site was they had found a couple bones, but there was, there was nothing to see. So, uh, he ended up he ended up uh, talking to one of the workers. The workers pulled him aside and said, "Hey, we're finding remains all the time here." So uh, that was the genesis of the investigation that led to the uncovering of you know the major uh, site, sacred site of, of the burial ground there. But if you go to the burial grounds in Lower Manhattan, and I highly recommend that you do. 
you'll find not only symbols from uh, West Africa, about 20 symbols from West Africa, but you also find a, a Ramapo Muncie Lenape medicine wheel there because the African burial grounds were built on top of, of Muncie burial grounds. And that's also uh, quite, a, quite a lesson for us today as well. And that again, we, we try to separate ourselves from each other and from our past and our future, but we're, we are uh, integrated in that way, in the way that many great rivers coming together, come together, as, as the waters come together. Uh, I think I think there's one more question I think I saw there. Let's see. Now, what does Manhattan mean? Uh, again, I'll say something controversial on this uh, broadcast. But Chief, uh, why don't you go ahead and, and put your hand over your ears then. Um, we're not only talking about the the, the ancients. Sometimes I, I wonder if they're ancients of the ancients. So it possible that Manhattan comes from even uh, older language or, or how the language has evolved, maybe earlier iterations of it. The most common uh, translation of Manhattan is, uh, is, is a land of many hills. Recently, some linguists have uncovered an account in which a person said it means the place where we get our arrows from, that the trees there were, were, might, might have been type of trees that were good for arrows. So that's another translation I've heard. And just meditating on the word itself, uh, mata, mata, not, it's, a, it's, it's um, an important word to know in Muncie. And so it's, it's a, a word meaning, it's a negative word, like, like don't, you no, know, mata. So ma na hata. I'm trying to figure out exactly what, what that means because the name we had for the Hudson River is the Mahi Kanatuk, Mahi Kanatuk, the river that flows both ways, Mahi Kanatuk. So there may be some relation between the Ma and Mahi Kanatuk and the Ma and uh, Manahata, or Manahatan. And the fact is it's an island at the, at the end of the river before it goes to the ocean. So I don't know, that could even be what it means, is the island at the end of the river before it goes to the ocean. So, you know, it, it, Hard, hard to say. I'm not a linguist, and um, wolf. So, so that's just uh, just an explanation. I think Chief had a, a, an answer for the last question. Oh, I'm sorry, Ness. Uh, Muncie means wolf. Also, I wanted to uh, I, I wanted to sort of we were talking about uh, people saying how how can one help? I think. First of all, start thinking better of yourself. Start thinking of yourself as, as a spiritual indigenous person. I think, and for, for our relatives that, I don't like the term white because it doesn't fit everybody. Everybody, it's like the, the negative word for other people. But I think if you see yourself as somewhat privileged, this is what I would say to you. Please be privileged. Don't get guilty. Be privileged. If you can do more on the phone than I can do outside begging with a cardboard sign, for God's sakes, get on the phone. Don't come outside. I don't want to feel better about it. We want resolution. Be the wonderful, beautiful, European-based people you can be. And when you start to explore that, then look at your own indigeneity. The next time you come to a, to a, a powwow or something, where you're killed because that's who your ancestors were. You know, don't come wearing eagle feathers. I, you know, I'm just saying be your beautiful self. By being your beautiful self, you are going to elevate your not only yourself, but everyone around you. So I really thank you for that. And I'm sorry I got a little animated, but it's kind of exciting to think of all the people out there that all of the allies, all of the beautiful things you can do to help so many. You know, so uh, thank you. And that, now for a little downside history, a lot of people you'll let you, you'll enjoy. This has to do with uh, geography. When when Buffalo Bill and them started these Wild West shows, and I think everybody knows our relatives out in the mid out, out in the West have these beautiful bonnets and horses and all the beadwork. I mean, today 
when you say Indian and you think American Indian, you're thinking these brothers with these beautiful eagle bonnets, and they are. And of course, our people here in the East, we wear castoas, which are little sort of little hats. And the reason is, and it, it's it's true globally. People's dress reflect where they live on the earth. It reflects their geography. Here in the East, we have a lot of woodland, a lot of brambles. No disrespect, but if these wonderful, beautiful war chiefs would show up here in all their magnificence in some place like New York, they would look like the Three Stooges trying to get through all this brush out here. At the same time, if we sat in a prairie with our castoas on, they would probably think there was a lot of like prairie chickens running around. They wouldn't know. So, or if you go out further out west, you see people uh, a lot of times, uh, you see a lot of Apache people have high boots and something more akin to short pants. Think about it. They're in hot weather and rattlesnakes. And that dress carries on throughout, throughout the world. So I, I just, for those who might have been wondering, why people dress different. So I know when the Wild West shows the first came to New York, a lot of people were saying, well, what kind of Indians are you? You don't have none of these beautiful uh, headdresses. So that doesn't have, that question hasn't happened in a long time, but I wanted to share it. Uh, so anyway, it's, it's, uh, it's interesting. One last thing, I think, just put people in context. We need to understand that we really do need to stand together. I, I see Pookie Lee there. And one of the truths that a lot of people don't understand is the reason we need to lift and elevate the, the voice of those who, are, who have been silent. When you think of Hawaii, you think of the most beautiful, uh, excuse me, of Hawaii, you think of the most beautiful people in the world, the most beautiful place. Did anybody tell you that going back 20 years, some of the, the most homeless people in, the, in, 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 in Hawaii was the Hawaiians? Because people come and stole their land, put houses on their land. That's what they're doing here in New York now. We're just a little, I guess we've got a little more mountainous, so we're a little more protected. They have stole Hawaii. You don't think of the Hawaiians like that. When you think, when you think of the, the uh, Maasai, you think of these beautiful tall brothers with the with the beautiful bead work and the, the elegance and the big spear. You don't think of these people being uh, uh, driven into the Congo as migrants to escape the oppression. These are things we've hidden and until now, and I'm, I'm gonna go back to Unity uh, Earth on this. Now we have the technology to bring the truth to the world to lift everybody up. We don't have to fight anybody. We just got to be honest about what is going on and how it's going on. But I'm just saying, if you think of those two examples I give with the syntax, who would have thought that the Maasai were actually fleeing and losing their capacity to do beadwork? Does anybody, has anybody even to this moment thought of a Bayi with the people of the land are struggling? So these these are these are just two of the many peoples globally. We're hoping with the, to as we work forward with the embassy uh, to bring some light to, to bring some understanding to, and to bring not just hope but some action to. And so for that, I'd like to. If there's any questions, I, I just wanted to thank you for letting me rant for that one moment. But it's very passionate when I think of our relatives. Uh, that don't have a voice and what's going on. And, uh, well, Chief, I think we've uh, come out of time and okay. I think can it's I time make, to transition to the beautiful people. Can I make one last comment? Go ahead, Go ahead Chief. Right now, in sure. this time, in this place, the reason that the truth can set you free is because of the technology you're seeing now. By applying the global technology that's being used right this moment will set all of us free and bring the unity of peace to all of us. And let me thank everybody for this broadcast and everybody's seeing it. I thank you. Anishi, 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 Anishi. Oh, thank you, Ben. Thank you all. Thank you, thank you, Chief. And uh, we have the effervescent and always uh, live and vivacious uh, Pookie Lee here. and. 
So Becky Suzik will uh, will talk more about the the event coming up here in uh, World Unity Week and and what's in store for us uh, here. And so just wanted to say everyone thank you for uh, being part of this circle. And as Chief Perry said, uh, you know, we're connecting with each other not only horizontally throughout the globe at this time and place right now, but also with our ancestors and, and our descendants, because we really do need to connect with each other if we're going to move forward in a good way. So, so uh, Anishik, uh, World Unity Week, uh, Purpose Earth, uh, Becky Suzik, Ben Bowler, and uh, looking forward to hearing from uh, Puki Lee Anishik. Thank you so much, Brother Al, Chief Dwayne. That was an extraordinary time together. And uh, I, I am taking so much, so much in to honor my own indigeneity and um, in the re-indigenization of myself and my reconnection with the earth. And both of you are such an inspiration to me and just so many, I'm so grateful. We've been able to bring your messages and, um, and wisdom to our collective here at World Unity Week. So um, welcome everybody. I'm Becky Suzik and I'm part of the World Unity Week team. We have hundreds of people who are on our team helping to co-create this event together for you and with you. And so I wanted to take a moment to let you know if you're finding our stream, we'd love to send you some emails so that we can invite you into one of our 32, 31. <laughs> we stopped growing now, my mind's going, which one are we, 31 or 32? Convergence rooms that opened today. So the convergence aspect means that we have room one right here, and we also have 30 plus um, schedules that you can look at of dedicated content around different themes. So I want to show you very briefly where you can find information so we can help you as easily as possible navigate your way and to not feel overwhelmed, to just trust that whatever Zoom room you find yourself in, there's other Zoom rooms that are going on, but right where you are is where you're supposed to be. So just trust that. And the beauty I'm excited about is for broadcasts that I'm not part of, I'll get to watch the recordings afterwards as well as participate this week. So enjoy the abundance of this collective blessings and these gifts that are coming through hundreds of people from all around the world who are dedicated to World Unity Week. So how you can register is you go to worldunityweek.org org forward slash participate and you just check at attend and hit submit and we will send you some email love and also you can go to our amazing beautiful website and this design of this map that was co-created but but designed by Kara Stonehouse at the Hague Center one of our co-producing um, organizations the Hague Center um, and so I'm going to show you if you come to our, our site and you click on one world right here now you'll see the map looks different if you were here yesterday. Yesterday, it was just right here with room one and, and um, we opened Sparkle yesterday, but now you have all of these amazing places to explore. And so I'm not gonna click in there because I'm, I'm gonna show you how you can, you can actually click in there and, and check out some rooms, but I wanna show you the, this particular room um, list really quickly. You can click right here to take you to the board of boards that will look like this. And these are the different topics of the room. So you can find your way in and look at the schedules. Or you can go down here and see the list of the convergence rooms with Zoom links right there. And it's okay for you to just click and jump in the Zoom room. You don't even have to know which event you're going into. If for some reason there's a healing circle going on, it may be closed, but but just trust, play um, play the, the, the let's, let's click a Zoom room and see, see what's going on. Because potentially there's things going in rooms, going on in rooms 24 hours a day, potentially. So you can look at all of the different descriptions of the different spaces and the different rooms that are here, like the May Peace Prevail on Earth. Each different convergence room has content and programs in the Zoom rooms, most of them, uh, th that are about this particular um, description here. So it can help you see, oh, you know, I'm really interested in purpose-based interest, pur purpose-based business and social enterprise. And you can just jump in the Zoom room or you can click here to check out the schedule. So I wanted to tell you about that. And the other thing I want to tell you is if you are lost, if you need help, if you want to give help, because you can join us to be part of our team, you can team up with us. We're called Team Up. 
you can jump in the hub. You see this mandala sunshine symbol. You'll see it everywhere. And this is personed by volunteers. So we have it open as many hours as we have volunteers to do it. So if it's not open at that time, try back half an hour later, it might be open. But we aspire to be there a lot. I hang out there a lot when I'm not here. So um, click on there and there will be some really amazing people that you'll meet in there that will help you find your way. So check out worldunityweek.org forward slash one world that you'll see it at the top one hyphen world and be sure to register. So thank you so much for joining us. We're going to end this stream, but we want you to keep watching because we're going to start a new stream with Pookie Lee and she's got an amazing program coming up that we want you to jump in the Zoom room with us, come to room one.